That's me on the right. And the other guy is Jim. Now, Jim's been one of my closest friends since my freshman year of college, really since the first day of freshman orientation. And the beautiful thing about my friendship with Jim is how different we are. I grew up in Denver. I went through much of college with long hair and a beaded necklace. I struggle to go a week without getting outside. Jim comes from Connecticut. He wears polo religiously. And he'd much rather play a round of golf than explore the wilderness. And Jim's a Patriots fan. So <laughs> you can imagine we're very different. But how can you grow and broaden yourself if you surround yourself entirely with like-minded people? Well, Jim's currently thriving at Georgetown Law. He's a bookworm and a weight room enthusiast with a strong bend to social justice. And he's always been great at arguing. And back in my undergraduate days, when I would ever optimistically preach clean energy to anybody who would listen, Jim was always the most interesting to talk to. And he'd play devil's advocate. And his best argument, I think, was something like, there are too many enormous issues in this world and too many daily tasks that we need to take care of first. It's hard to argue against that. This photo was taken in 2009. The financial world order as we knew it had just cratered. Regardless of whether or not Jim believed in climate change, were melting ice caps more pressing than unemployment? See, Jim was challenging my beliefs. And that was, and still is, important to me. Because there are 7 billion people in the world. And honestly, most of them think like Jim. There are more enormous issues and too many acute daily needs that we need to address first. But clean energy is my cause, and I'll spend a career trying to help free the world of its dependence on fossil fuels, however that might be. I watched the small ground Denver worsen year by year growing up. I studied environmental science in college, and I formed this viewpoint that societal progress can be wonderful, but it's nothing if it's not sustainable. I earned my PhD at CU studying lithium ion battery materials, motivated by scientific curiosity and the impact application of the electric vehicle. And then I co-founded a company right out of grad school working to commercialize a battery I helped develop as part of my PhD. So at this point, I'm really banking on the whole clean energy thing working. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just a passion anymore, it's my livelihood. And I really love skiing and I want it to keep snowing. So I've been thinking, how do we convince Jim that we need to change our means of obtaining and using energy today. Well, luckily, Henry Ford showed us how about 100 years ago. So let's go back in time. What did New York City look like in 1890? Well, there's one enormous difference from the city we know today, and it almost screams out at you from this picture. Nobody's honking their horn. There's no cars. There's no traffic. But it might have been worse. In 1890, there were 150,000 horses living in New York City limits. In London, there were just as many. Huge numbers everywhere. And on average, a horse produces 15 to 35 pounds of manure every day. Times 150,000 horses, that's 4.5 million pounds of manure left on New York City streets every day. That is incomprehensible. <laughs> and it's something that urban planners didn't think about in the late 19th century. The New Yorker called it the great horse manure crisis of 1894. <laughs> and at the time, people were starting to freak out, rightfully so. One commentator predicted that by 1930, Manhattan would be buried to its third story windows <laughs> in manure. <laughs> the Times of London forecast that London would be buried in its entirety in nine feet of manure by 1950. This was a public health crisis. So in 1898, the world's first urban planning conference was held in New York City, and it was dominated by this issue. And projections for the implications of the problem went out decades because nobody could imagine cities without horses. But Manhattan isn't buried in horse crap today. Most people don't even know about the crisis of 1894. It just kind of went away. And it wasn't regulation or policy. So what was it? How was the biggest environmental crisis of the time solved? 
Simply, someone made a better product that everyone could afford. Now, before the 1920s, over a thousand car manufacturers existed globally. And they started to market their vehicles as solutions to the horse problem because crisis is opportunity. The automobile industry saw this. The technology was there for years, decades really. But cars were for the rich, and horses owned the era. Until Henry Ford figured it out with the Model T. He achieved low cost, high quality, convenience, and a message everyone could understand. Automobiles are for everybody. He achieved mass appeal, taking the automobile from an expensive curiosity to a practical convenience. In achieving mass appeal, he displayed brilliance. His unprecedented wages, the advent of the assembly line, obsessive attention to detail. I actually love his philosophy that nothing is particularly difficult if you divide it into small jobs. But the key, Henry Ford wasn't anti-manure. He was <laughs> pro-practicality. He made a compelling product. Now, the advent of the automobile is directly transferable to today's energy issues. Our problems today are the same as the horse manure crisis in four ways. A dirty energy source, affecting everybody, hotly contested solutions, and the technology on hand to solve the problem. It's ironic, I know, the anecdote I've chosen to describe our ability to achieve some technological tipping point lies at the very root of the problem we face today. But human progress is iterative. So here's the good news. We have the technology needed to get off of fossil fuels. Wind energy is developed. In August 2015, the average price of wind energy to utility purchasers averaged under 2.5 cents per kilowatt hour, making wind, in certain localities, the low cost option. Solar, in certain localities where energy is expensive, is the low cost option. And these are facts today. I work on batteries, so I'm a huge believer in energy storage. Well, if you pair those technologies with batteries, the possibilities are limitless. The localities of low-cost clean energy expand indefinitely. This spring, Bloomberg called batteries the key to clean energy. AES Energy is building a 100 megawatt battery array in Northern Ireland today, made up of giant batteries that look like this one. That's a huge battery. In theory, it could support 100,000 homes. And projects like this are happening all over the world. This is another company's global energy storage portfolio. Electric vehicles are already there. The new Chevy Bolt costs $35,000. The Tesla Model 3 falls in around the same price next year. You can get a used Nissan Leaf for 10,000 bucks. The best-selling EV in China, called the Panda, sells for 8,500 US. That's incredible. See, we don't need fossil fuels. We don't need them. The technology is there. It's just not pervasive. Why? When 97% of climate scientists agree that climate change is real and man-made. When the World Health Organization calls pollution the world's single largest environmental health risk. Why don't these technologies have mass appeal? My argument is that we're focusing on the wrong arguments. Like Ford did after horse manure, we need to show commercial practicality. The message can't just be emotionally green anymore. It has to be green in the wallet. Jim challenged me to reframe my message, and I challenged the proponents of climate change to think seriously about their own with an emphasis on efficiency. We need to seek creativity in the clean energy business to make these technologies appealing not just emotionally, but economically. This has evolved into a business problem. And there are many encouraging examples already. Tesla attacked the luxury market first, made a brilliant proof of concept, and is now working down to the masses. That's very unusual, and it's working. There's ingenuity in the solar industry as well. Third party financing, vertically integrated solar companies, power purchase agreements, all examples of business model ingenuity and creativity. And people are getting rich off this. The shift to clean energy has been called the greatest business opportunity of our time. There's room for another Henry Ford on the grid, and I think the world needs one. And for the rest of us, you and I, what can we do? 
Well, I implore you to become aware of these creative business models and to buy into them. If we really care about the issues, we can't just be college me preaching in the air of people who just don't always see things the way that we do. Pew Research found that 48% of Americans believe climate change is a threat. But renewables only make up 11% of our energy mix here in the States. That's a huge disconnect. There's a lack of immediacy. And changing the way that we talk about the issue can make others realize that they can do something. And it doesn't take much. Most major utilities have renewable energy programs available to their customers in many cases where the customer can save money. It takes about five minutes to get online and sign up, tell your friends, and then you're a part of the solution. See, we're at this tipping point in clean energy, what Jeffrey Moore has famously called the chasm. It's this mysterious hole along a technology's adoption curve between early adoption and market volume. And it only closes when enough of us take the leap. The more we increase the demand for the technology, the more we increase the opportunity for its practical implementation. Of course, the politics of climate change make a huge difference in narrowing that gap, but at the end of the day, the technologies absolutely have to catch on. And that's on the consumer. And for Jim, and those like Jim, the clean energy product just needs to be the obvious choice. I pulled this line from a recent text conversation with him, and I love it because I think it's kind of funny, and it summarizes my point very well. <laughs> He says that the day that he can make the economically rational decision to make the buy-in electric Silverado, he will. He'll be there when the time comes. So where's that tipping point? When does clean energy achieve mass appeal? Well, when it makes obvious, straightforward, and crystal clear sense to everyone. And for those of us who already see it, it's time to buy in, to change our rhetoric, and take action so that we don't become New York City buried three stories deep in horse manure. Thank you. <laughs>